Welcome to geothermal energy. An overview of geothermal energy. Basically, the deeper you go in the Earth's surface, the hotter it gets. So if we look at depth and miles, um, as we go down to about 4,000 miles deep, we go all the way to 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat flows um, from, from outward from the Earth's interior, and the heat's transported by convection in the molten mantle here, and then it's transported by conduction in the solid crust, the outer layer, which is about a thousand kilometers thick. The most common methods that um, scientists use to find geothermal reservoirs is to drill a deep well and test the temperature underground. Um, steam or very hot water from deep within the earth is then gonna be piped to the surface and it can be used as a heat source or to produce electricity. So basically the kinetic energy from the movement of this molten in the earth can then be converted into um, electricity or heat. So geothermal power plants use this heat to basically generate steam to make electricity just like a steam turbine would run on um, coal or natural gas or even um, hydropower that that turns a turbine, but this is gonna be with steam. Geothermal heat pumps tap into the heat that's much closer to the Earth's surface, and that can actually heat water or heat, provide heat for buildings. So if we look at um, high geothermal sources, such as here we have a geyser, um, this water and steam can be at temperatures above 180 to 200 degrees Celsius. So if you've ever been to Yellowstone, you know that you can't get too close because it's actually quite hot um, and as the steam that actually comes out. So again, our, our goals and uses of this geothermal, we can use it as a heat pump, direct use applications, or to produce electricity. And so our goal is to use this renewable energy. It's the core of the Earth's um, surface of, of the, sorry, the interior. And the idea is that we can use it for electricity and heat so we're not burning natural gas for electricity use or burning coal or natural gas or nuclear or other sources to get electricity. So again, there's lots of different uses for geothermal and it really just depends on the temperature. So if the heat differential, if we're very close to the Earth's surface, if it's only, um, you know, between 470 degrees Fahrenheit, then we're normally going to do more heat pumps, right? Or even soil warming for warming like a greenhouse effect. If it's up to 100, that's where you have your thermal, your thermal baths that are quite lovely, as well as aquaculture. We can also do snow melting. Um, as we get a little bit higher, up to 150, we might use it for drying, for, for mushrooms, for food processing, for curing concrete blocks, greenhouses. Again, building like a whole building. Um, water heating versus a residential. Um, you might use it for pasteurization, cooking. And then finally, if we get very hot, then we might use it more for refrigeration, lumber, and then finally for um, power plants um, with binary plants being the, the cooler ones and the flash dry steam being the very hottest ones. So again, there's various ways to use this. So the very high heat content is gonna be used to produce the electricity. While the direct use, as we, as we talked about, is going to be agricultural, greenhouse heat and soil warming, aquaculture, industrial uses for drying and warming and, and production, and then residential and district heatings. And then finally, we can use geothermal heat pumps to either heat or cool buildings or to melt um, snow from sidewalks and roads. So if we look at where these, um, where is this geothermal heat? Um, basically, you can look at these large dots are these major enthalpy geothermal producing areas. So again, we have some here um, where the China plate is. We also have um, them on the west coast of the US and South America. We have it here um, and here is Iceland. Um, and we also have it in various places in Europe as well as Africa. And if we think this really, this ring of fire you may have heard of. And so here is kind of, again, this ring of fire going up the, um, up the South America, North America, and then down through um, Japan 
and um, Indonesia and um, here in New Zealand. So if we look specifically at the US, here are our, what we call our class one, and this is for deep enhanced geothermals. This is what we're gonna use more for electricity versus more shallow that we would use for heat pumps. And you can see that it's concentrated in the Western part of the United States, where we have class one, which is the most favorable, compared to um, class five, which is least favorable, or other classes where there really isn't any geothermal activity. Um, again, and when we talk about most favorable versus least favorable, we're talking about the degrees being anywhere from zero to 200 degrees Celsius. And we do have some US operating plants, power plants, where we're actually getting geothermal electricity. So actually here in Maryland, we're actually getting, we have heat pumps at the University of Maryland. The transportation center um, has a heat pump underneath um, some of our, um, some of our transportation stations where the, um, where the buses are parked and whatnot. But here in the West Coast is where we actually produce electricity from that. So these are all of our geothermal power plants that we have in the US. So if we look at top um, geothermal countries, this is specifically for electricity, not for heating. So if we're looking at um, milliwatts of electricity, um, milliwatts E, um, the most is actually in the US, followed by Indonesia, Philippines, Turkey, New Zealand, Mexico, and Kenya. So again, most of these are in um, US, Indonesia, Philippines, Turkey, and New Zealand. So most of them in the US are, are in the Western states, as well as Alaska and Hawaii, with, with California generating the most. These dry steam reservoirs, which again are much higher, are some of the largest known dry steam fields in the world and has been producing electricity since the 1960s. So we have seven states that have these geothermal power plants, um, but it's still 0.4% of the total electricity in the US is produced by geothermal. So if we look at our renewable energy coming from the 1960s um, through 2020, we can see that um, our geothermal is this little yellow slice. So it's not very big, um, but it has stayed consistent. Um, but our power plants basically in the, the 90s and the 80s is when we built them and they're just now producing, but we haven't been installing a lot more capacity as we have been installing more capacity for biomass, um, hydroelectric, and then finally wind and solar. So if we look at our capacity additions, um, the expectation is in 2017, again, we didn't have any geothermal capacity additions, um, but we did have a few retirements, so one, one geothermal plant, 1% retired. And if we look at the capacity, again, we went slightly down in geothermal in 2017. But if we look at the future projections from 2018 forward, we see that again, 2% of our electricity is from geothermal and it's expected to rise to about four percent so a not a huge increase but it is expected to increase slowly over time so if we look at direct use of geothermal iceland is the world's leader with about 93 percent of its homes are used are heated so this is direct not producing electricity but directly heated with geothermal so for this reason iceland saves over 100 million annually in avoided oil and natural gas endpoints and therefore is considered one of the cleanest countries around the world due to all the heating that they need in iceland because it's a very cold climate but all the geothermal resources that they use for that heating other direct uses again not producing to electricity but just using the heat directly um, here in Japan, we have geothermal um, water and heat in buildings from these springs that are used every year. Again, we have, um, we've been using it directly for a long time in the US. We have greenhouses that are again heated with geothermal water. Um, here is inside them in New Mexico where that's heated um, through geothermal 24 hours a day. You can also heat with the fish hatcheries. So here's a fish hatcheries in Mammoth Springs, Colorado that is heated. So here's a prawn, again, grown in Oregon through fish hatcheries. Um, here we have an alligator farm in Idaho, also geothermally heated. And then a commercial dehydration plant where we basically dry onions for Burger King for this one um, using geothermal um, heat and steam. You can also use it again, direct use. So here we have direct use of geothermal water under sidewalks. It basically keeps the temper of the sidewalk stable so that in the cold weather, we don't get ice and snow built up on the sidewalk or directly to heat homes in here in Oregon. 
So when we talk about just heating homes, we usually talk about heat pumps. And so what a heat pump does is in the winter, the heat is collected from underground here in our geothermal um, zone. And then it's gonna be warmer in the winter. So the ground underneath is warmer than the air inside the house. And so it, the, the heat energy is pumped from the ground to the house. But in the summer, this heat pump again is still moving, but this time the air is warmer than in the ground in the geothermal level. So the heat energy is pumped down and the colder air rises up to cool the house in the summer. So again, these um, shallow, the shallow ground temperatures are affected, but these deeper temperatures, if we're just going 15 meters down, you can see that they're not affected by the temperature in the environment. So from zero to five meters, we do see that effect, but once we get to 10 meters down, we're no longer seeing the effects of um, the, the seasons on the temperature. So there's four basic types of these ground loop systems for heat pumps. There's um, the closed systems, which are either gonna be horizontal, vertical, or pond lake, and then you have open loop, uh, open loop systems. So the best choice depends on the climate, the soil conditions, the land, and the local installation costs, but all can be used for residential or commercial buildings. So here we have a vertical system. So again, it's gonna come on, and then again, it's gonna go down that 10 meters, at least to get to that um, constant temperature. Um, we might also have a horizontal one where maybe if the temperature is, depending on where the temperature ranges um, are and where how close the, the um, heat source might be, then we might actually just go down a little bit and then go horizontal. So again, we can, the reason why we do this is to increase the surface area. We can increase the surface area anymore by the slinky. So again, that allows the, um, the surface area of the pipe to increasingly be in contact with the cooler or warmer, depending on the, on the season, um, soil around there. And so it helps with the heat transfer, either the cool or the warm. You can also do it in a pond where you actually have a pond system that's dug down and then you actually do um, kind of like you would in a solar thermal system where you have heat coils there that then is, is transferring the heat or the coolness into um, the pipe. Um, again, it can be used almost everywhere. They're pretty energy and cost efficient. They conserve fossil fuels. And again, they provide both heating and cooling with no emissions from burning fossil fuels. Now, when we talk about geothermal power plants, so now we're gonna produce electricity. They require more high temperatures. So from 300 to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and it can come from dry steams or hot water wells. So we have the dry um, steam plants, the flash plants, and then the binary cycle plants. So again, these high enthalpy systems, um, if they're vapor dominated, so the dry, they're the most productive. The steam is dry, it's free of liquid water, very high enthalpy. An example is um, in Italy. Um, the liquid dominated is higher hydrostatic pressure because it has this liquid. And as the pressure decreases then, it will flash up to steam. And so this wet steam can then be used to drive the turbine, for example, in New Zealand. So here at the top, we have our dry steam power plant. So again, we have our geothermal zone that steam just goes directly. We don't have to do anything. It goes directly, it moves our turbine. And then we have a condenser that condenses it back through an injection well. And what you'll see above it is just air and water vapor. It's just air. Um, and if you see here, we have our single flash steam power plant. Here, we're gonna actually have our, um, as the pressure releases, then the steam will release, that steam will go from the turbine. But again, we're gonna have the brine that comes down, that water that then's gonna come by and again, go back through your injection well. And then again, we have our cooling tower and our, um, and we can use some of the water, the heat directly as well. If we have a binary cycle, then again, we're gonna have a heat exchanger. So the brine is gonna stay here then we're gonna heat exchange and then we're gonna use isobutane to do the flashing for the steam vapor that we have. So we're gonna use an isobutane vapor instead of a water vapor that we use directly with a single flash. And then again, you can, um, it's, a, it's a loop here with our cooling tower and then our injection well. And then finally, if we have a single flash steam power plant, or sorry, double flash, we're actually going to use the, um, the steam brine for a first stage and a second stage turbine because we can still get more energy out of it. Um, and then again, a conduction injection well. 
Again, the dry steam is the most commercially attractive. Um, it's not contaminated with water. It's really, <laughs> when it reaches the surface, it is fast. Um, it's, it sounds like a jet engine. Um, so it's loud, but again, the con and the problem, we might get some problem with condensation gas, but it is a dry steam. So when it condenses, we might need to treat some of that condensate. Um, but again, it's the most, um, it's the hottest and most efficient. Again, these dry steam plants, we're just going to have the dry steam coming through, moving the turbine and then the injection well. So they're um, direct use systems for electricity. With our single flash system, again, we have that hot water and then you have the flash tank. And that flash tank is where it's going to release the pressure which releases the steam. And so then that steam comes in, but the water stays, that separated water stays for injection here. And then again, as we said, the double flash, it's just the parasitic loss. So again, if we have low total dissolved solids and, and not a lot of dissolved gases, we can kind of do a first and second um, drive. Um, but it does need more um, large liquid volumes, but it can increase the output of over 25% over the single flash system. So again, these geofarmer plants, just to summarize, they don't burn fuel to generate electricity, so their emissions are very low. Again, release just 1% of the carbon dioxide emissions of a fossil fuel plant. Um, they use a scrubber system to clean the air of hydrogen sulfide and emit 75% um, sulfur compounds than fossil fuel emissions. So again, if we're looking at electricity, they're high efficient, they're reliable 24 hours a day. This isn't like sun or, sun, sun or wind that may go up and it's gonna go all the time. Um, and again, conserves um, fossil fuels. There's no transportation involved. We don't have to bring it somewhere, but it's only used in certain locations, right? And it can't, right now, it's a very low percentage of our current energy needs. Again, when we have the water, some of that water may have corrosive minerals that maybe need to be disposed of in the condensate. Um, there are some harmful gases that we need to make sure that we're capturing and not emitting. Um, these piping systems does cause a large areas of land. Usually, again, it's underground, but we need a large area of land to install the piping system so those initial costs can be high. So thank you very much for learning about geothermal systems.